before we do the intro, Drew, I have a little special treat for you. So I was walking around at Target and I found a Drew shirt and I was like, maybe I'll pick that up. What? My kids were super into it. So I'm going to wear a Drew shirt today. Nice. <gasps> it is a Look blue shirt. at that. With bananas on it. Oh, that is excellent. Why bananas? Why not? Well done, sir. My kids loved it. And I was like, all right, let's try this out. How are you feeling about this? So this I'm is loving a, it. This is a lot happening. I'm loving in it. In one frame here. That is marvelous. I was like, I can't. In good, I can't. Well, like, it's, it's it's in nice all and, seriousness. It's, it's, wear this all day. It's good and airy. It doesn't feel like it's, it's very light. It's yeah. not like very thick. So. Yeah, that's delightful. It fits well too. Yeah, it's it's Brian sized. You know? Yeah. So we'll see how this it's goes. It's like good on the sleeves, good in the chest. It's yeah. a little tight on the sleeves, but you know, I'm like, no, that's just well, that's just kind of busting. That's, that's, that's those you know? those those logger arms. You can't do that's anything right. about that. That's right. That's just a side effect of your hobbies. <laughs> Look at this. All right, you ready to do this? Oh, this is marvelous. The shirt strength is, this is uh, gonna be amazing. Might be too much. It's good if you're an audio listener this week because you can't, <laughs> can't handle all this. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Welcome to episode number 85 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about our favorite pen design elements, favorite pens for frequent ink changing, the biggest communities that we see buying pens from Goulet Pens, uh, which pens that we would pick for the characters in the Mario Super Brothers, no, Mario Brothers universe, right? Yeah. Mario, Super Mario Brothers universe, That's whatever. That's it. Uh, we're gonna talk about if writing hard over time makes your nibs more flexible. We're gonna be spotlighting the Monteverde MVP, and we'll talk about what we've got going on at home. In addition to wearing loud shirts, that's what's happening today. It's a virus and I've infected him. <laughs> well, you know, I thought I'd try it out. We'll see what the fans think. But anyway, we'll start this thing out with some feedback. All right. We are going to hear from Honeybee3884 to kick things off today. And Honeybee says, of course, Drew is a Pisces rat. It all makes sense now, uh, being the date of our birth. We're you both know, we're both rats. Rat kings, yes. I happen to be a Pisces as well. Um, the Honeybee three eight eight four says, "Fellow fish rat, it's like cat dog, but cooler." I'm a bull rat, I guess. Apparently, bull rat. Do you remember the cat dog cartoon? I do remember that. Never watched it, but I remember it. Yeah, it was solid. Had a yeah. good theme song. Now it's stuck in my head. Thanks, yeah. Honeybee. There you go. And then Maurice Hotblack <laughs> says, "Hi, Drew and Brian. I'm fairly new to the fountain pen thing." I got into it by journaling for my mental health. Mm. I never knew I could cope with two blokes casually extemporizing in superfluously tangential ways, bringing in extraneous and informal information about pens, paper, and ink, amongst others, for two hours at a time. Wow, that is a sentence right there. But somehow, time flies by. You have such a warm, welcoming show that is highly entertaining, has a great feeling of community, mm. and keeps a smile on my face. It feels like you two are my friends. I was watching a show from a while back, episode 53, where you two were talking about neurodivergence within the pen community. Mm -hmm. When Drew started talking about serial hobbies, hyper-focused, dart-focused, di deep diving into subjects, my jaw basically hit the floor. I thought you were talking about it in my head. Turns out, I have some strong ADHD traits I didn't know about. I can't thank you enough because that has helped me change the whole direction of my psychotherapy treatment Whoa. and for the better. Thank you so much. Cheers, Dave. Wow. Look that is this. far more than we bargained for when we started this pencast. <laughs> Accidental helpful knowledge in the pencast. How about yep. that? Oops. <laughs> Every now and then. Hey, we've all got mental health stuff that we do going on and the more we talk about it the better it helps people. absolutely and the more you can find friends that uh, might be able to accidentally shed some light on some things the better there you go that's really cool yeah all right i got one from aspasia b i for one welcome our new ellie overlord that's because your daughter's gonna take over and she is overthrow you and she's shove me into a closet yep she's working on it every day um this is from ed Dun ed ed Dun 7518 Team 1984, glad I'm not the only one that eats cake rolls like that. Kit Kats are also a whole ordeal to eat. I'm starting to think it's an ADHD thing, lol. What a theme. <laughs> um, Kit Kats, I don't have a, as specific a method of eating Kit Kats. Yeah, neither do I. Yeah. You don't, you don't, like, you at least separate them before you, 
you don't like take the whole I'm chunk. Not a, I'm not a monster. monster. Okay, good. We can still yeah, be friends. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, yeah, I always separate them. Yeah. I can't think of. What uh, about string cheese? Do you pull the cheese? Or do you do you bite the? cheese? I pull the cheese. Good man. If, if it comes apart easily, if you if you start to pull a little string and then it like just is coming off in these measly little things yeah. and I'm just like, just forget it. Yeah. You know? Um, there were so many people, Brian, that agreed with your method of Swiss the cake Swiss roll cake consumption. Cake. Yeah. They were like, that's what I do. Oh my God. Like there were a lot of like shockingly high amount of people. It's like the first time I've ever discussed that publicly with anyone. <laughs> Just randomly, because again, I had not eaten one of those things in at least a decade. It was, no, so many people were super it's into really that. It's really funny. It well, was I'm amazing. Glad. I'm glad. I feel seen. Well, I was seen because I did it on video. Literally. What's really funny about that, though, is I think in reference to the, you know, whatever protein bar that I was eating at the beginning, yeah. not so graciously, um, Rachel was like, Brian, you really should not eat during the pancakes. And then we got all this feedback about the Swiss cake roll, and I was like, so should I not eat like that in the thing. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> it was like the most replied. <laughs> that one I figured topic. I was Yeah, that, that one I figured was safe because it was quiet, but she doesn't like the munching. And I get it. Yeah. I mean, back in the early Goulet Pens days when we had to do live streams at like 9 30 at night after working a full day with the baby and everything, mm. um, I would like eat popcorn during our broadcast and stuff. And people were like, dude, stop <laughs> it with the popcorn. And I was like, Okay, I get that. I get that. So yeah, sorry, nobody, sorry, nobody, everybody. Nobody likes listening to people chew, but you know. I know. I know. It's 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 a it, this is a casual it's a, atmosphere. It's casual, but like it it I I need to. We I, did talk today. I can about, be a little more conscientious. We did talk that. today about getting like a button that if we needed to, a, you know, a mute button, a or Brian a, chewing or, button, basically, or, or me clearing my throat, <laughs> or coughing button. Yeah. Yeah, we'll look into that. But anyway. Um, good feedback. It's noted. Uh, and then Spencer Watches says, RC cars are a dangerous rabbit hole. Boy, are they. Um, I got my first hobby grade vehicle, an Axial Trophy truck. Ooh. Uh, a few weeks ago, and I've already upgraded the servo, changed the shock oil, broke and replaced a bearing, and did a bunch of cable management. It's awesome. Uh, what kind, what kind, well, sorry, was kind of a childhood fantasy for me too. So I'm having a blast running it into things at speed. That's awesome. I have a tangent about all that, but I'll save it for the what's happening. Portion there we go. Because more things have happened. Oh, but boy. Anyway. Um, cool. Well, thank you for the feedback, everybody. Glad that everybody's enjoying the nonsense that comes out of this whole thing. Um, but we have some actual pen things to talk about, so we'll get that out of the way, and then we can have some fun. Pen things. All right. Let's talk some new stuff. All right. So I got a few new things, some pretty exciting things to talk about, honestly. Um, so... Building off of the successes that we've seen with our Banu Euphoria drink collection, the yes, the ice latte is continuing to be the surprise stunner pen that uh, we could have never dreamed it to be, uh, or only only dreamed it to be, or hoped it to be, or whatever. Uh, but anyway, we have a new pen. So this is the uh, next in our series of drinks called Watermelon Mojito. And I got to say, I'm very pleased with how this came out. We went through a few, a few iterations with them because they, you know, they have to do a lot of experimentation to try to do this because they're doing some, some like materials and stuff that just is not normal for most pens, but they really nailed it with this. I love like the way the green glitter kind of came out and like these kind of clumps, but it makes sense. The green like grip material and the everything. The grip, and then I think like there's a really there's good. a portion up at the top that has that too. Like yeah, it looks. Oh, it's the it's the, it's um, the center it's band. The center band. Yeah. yeah, it looks really good. Really deep. The very pink, shimmery. The pink is like so spot on for like that watermelon, like fleshy fruit material, it looks and then a, yeah, the pearlescence and the swirliness to it. It just, I'm so happy with it. I've I loved, was loved shocked at yeah. how much I love that pen. Yeah. So anyway, go check that thing out. It's got a number six size steel nib in fine, medium, and broad. It is a Goulet exclusive. We've designed this, uh, co-designed co it with Banu, and uh, we have it for $149. So not sure how long we'll have it. Um, depends how popular it is, I guess. But, you know, we'll It see. might be a one and done thing. We'll see. It could be. It could be. But, you know, it depends. If y'all want more of them, we might have potential to get more. Um, some other pens, speaking of exclusives, we have another exclusive with Sailor. I think we talked about this one last week, but we maybe potentially have launched this by the time this video goes out, unless something crazy happens. It's possible. As of recording this, it's in transit, so we'll see if it actually arrives. But we have our Sailor Pro Gear and Pro Gear Slim Northern Lights. This is the next one in our series. This is a blue color. 
and we're very pleased with how these ones turned out. Um, so we have those in both of the sizes with the full range of nibs um, for 312 and 440 respectively. So pretty excited about those. 14 and 21 karat gold nibs on those respectively. Great sailor pens. And then last one I have to talk about is the Platinum 3776 Century Pen. This is the limited edition and Drew, I swear, put this on my list so that I would have to try to pronounce this. Uh, I've, I've war, Nailed it. Maybe. Um, it's basically ivory, uh, but it's a uh, part of their Shape of Heart series. So I guess they've done one, they did one other Shape of Heart. This is the next one. So basically the platinum nibs, when they punch out the hole in the nib, uh, the little breather hole right at the top of the slit there, it's in the shape of a heart. Well, I guess they save all those hearts and they cast it into the finial on the cap of the pen. And uh, you can see they put actually put two of those suckers in there so you can uh, see them because they can be a little tough to see in there. But um, they put a couple of them in there with some other like little gems and stuff to make it look all cool and pretty. So very classy look in this pen. Just the nice the ivory with like the silver and everything. It just uh, really, really looks nice. So we have those in a variety of nib sizes. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know how long they'll be out. They do a numbered limited thing and, you know, I feel like a the year, previous maybe? ones were out about a, a year, year or so. Yeah. yeah, it depends how they sell, but you know. Anyway, that's what we got going on. What do you got, Drew? We also have the 2023 Pelican Edelstein Ink for Ooh, the year, yeah, we which do. are always popular. Yeah. This year, they really do a good job with these. They do, they yeah. do, and then Edelstein is not known for having crazy colors. They've pretty much got a solid, yeah. well-regarded assortment. But then every year they've got one special edition that comes out that is usually a grand slam. Yeah. And this year it is rose quartz, mm -hmm. and it is a pink, but it is a, uh, it's it shades really well, and it is a darker pink, but doesn't cross quite into magenta territory, and yeah. it's not a hot pink either. It's a very calm pink that I think will appeal to a lot of different people. I think it's yeah. versatile and can be enjoyed by anybody. I, I think it's yeah. really nice. I'm very fickle when it comes to pink inks. I don't like them where they're like too like weak and you know, where they lean a little too red. I either want it to be like a deep magenta yeah. or like a nicer rose color like this. Yeah, like a, this just is very like rose. A pure kind of pink, yeah. This it's is a really, really nice one. one. Yeah. yeah, so I think this will do well. It is 29 the, package, the packaging, like Adel, the Edelstein package. is some yeah. of the nicest looking packaging. It really does. Like the bottle itself, but then also the box and everything. It just looks really good. Absolutely one of the coolest bottles. One of the heaviest bottles too. It's sturdy and the cap is really thick and you know it's not going to crack on you no matter how yeah. hard you tighten it well i mean to a point it's a great but gift bottle if you wanted to really give good, someone yeah. some ink that is nice a wide solid. neck so it's easy yeah. to fill pretty much anything out of it i'm a big fan absolutely yeah. and going off of what we discussed last week i mentioned that uh, a document ink sample set by dime uh da, sorry detrimentus is going to happen it should be released by time this airs so uh yeah. there will be a set of eight document inks from detrimentus we couldn't do them all because we wanted to stick with eight um but uh, we picked our most popular ones within that series so thank you for your recommendations and uh, as always let us know we are listening so that'll be available as well so yay for more ink sample sets nice also, some new sailor pens have showed up, and they are within a collection called Solar Term. So they're all mm, seasonal, solstice-y, and equinoxy. Yeah. yeah. Um, they are $236. They're all um, Pro Gear Slim and in four colors. Uh, I'll show some pictures so you can see what I'm talking about. But each one of them kind of represents an equinox, a solstice. And there's one that actually is a citrus bath, a citrus bath to ward off winter cold. Why not? Like if you got the sniffles. Yeah. Citrus bath. So more or less they are seasonal inspired colors, but they're very pretty. And Sailor just kind of continues to impress me with uh, putting together surprising but really well-coordinated colors in their yeah. pens. They're on it, man. Yeah, they do. All right. That's the stuff that's new. All right, cool. Let's do some Q&A. Let's. All right. Our friend, the Branimator, is kicking things off today. And the Branimator himself is asking you, Brian, mm. what are some of your favorite design elements on fountain pens or elements you'd like to see? It's a good question. It is a good question. Good question. Um, my thoughts are going to be kind of disparate. They're just kind of yeah. random. So I didn't try to like design it into one dream pen or anything. Yeah, you've got no, questions we've, we've done like that. that. We've before. done a Franken pen recently. Yeah. Um, for me, after all these years, 
I do still dig the like demonstrator or like the translucent color pens. You know, they were like, they weren't an unheard of thing when we first kind of got into the pen scene, you know, 2009, 2010. But it definitely is something that like has gotten much more widely popular and accepted with, you know, embracing of that kind of demonstrator, you know, design. Um, and I, you would think that like after so many brands doing it in so many different models of pens, that it might be a little played out, but no, I still love it. I love being able to see what goes on inside the pens. I love being able to see all the parts. I'm just a tinkerer at heart. And so the more I can see going on, the better, not like exclusively. It's not like I like all clear pens better than anything else, but I really, I really appreciate the like translucency and, and that as like a design element in certain pens. So that's kind of cool, you know? So yeah, I dig that. That's good. Um, what else? I really like cap inserts. Like think about like Twisby or like a lot of the pilot pens, you know, a specific, no matter what the cap design is, having like a plastic insert that just hugs around that nib, keeps it nice and sealed up. It just keeps that nib wet and ready to go at all times. I really dig that. Spring-loaded inner caps are even better. Spring-loaded is even better though. Even that's not even a requirement for me, but I just, I wish all pens had that. They should. They really should. They really should. They really should. They really should. So I do like that. Um, let's see here. I like inlaid and hooded nibs. Mm, you know, maybe those are it's just fun. those are fun. And I mean, they're I love, unique. I love like big, beautiful nibs with cool designs. Would you and stuff still like, that, like them if it was a common thing, though? I don't think I would. Yeah. I think I like it because you don't see it as often. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I genuinely like the design element of it too. They like, do look good. Thing in like a Pilot E ninety five S, one of mm. your faves. Beautiful. Um, an integrated nib like the Pilot M ninety that we talk about a lot. That is super cool because you never see it. Um, but just the design is pretty neat too. Um, or like a pen, like the Lamy 2000 with a hooded nib, I think is pretty interesting. Though, you know, I do kind of miss like that big robust like nib. So I, I appreciate both. I feel like if I had all inlaid and hooded nibs, I'd be like, oh, okay, I'm kind of I'm kind of over this, but I don't know. I still like it, I think, because I don't see it as often. Um, the Pilot Sterling, that's another one that's got an inlaid nib that's pretty cool. Um, let's see here, I love Rodden. Yes, you do. I just love Rodden. You I'm do. kind of a sucker for it. Everybody else is like, gosh, freaking abalone again, like more pens. And I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of not sick of it yet, though. Like, well, the, I'm not like, the one that calls all the shots. You've got so Rodden like, you know, and you've got abalone. Like, True. I mean, Rodden is... I, Rodden is like the... I don't know if it's always with abalone shell, but I believe it's it's pretty much with abalone right, shell. Right, it, but it's the Japanese. It's a little or, different. Well, it, it can be a little different. I, yeah. love, I love abalone, but it can be... It can be a bit much, you know what I mean? It's sort of like if you ate only cake for your entire meal, you'd be like, all right, I still like cake, but like <laughs> it's kind of a lot, you know what I mean? So I feel like it's like all dessert. Yeah. So I really like pens that have rotten like as elements of it. Yes. I find that when it's like kind of sprinkled in there, I'm like, oh, I want more of that. Just like I always want more cake. <laughs> But I know that if I had more, that it might feel like too much. So I, I like the tease. Nice. I like being able to see it in there, but when it's not like the only thing happening. You know, if that makes sense? Yeah, it does. It's this, weird, it's this weird dance. We all have to control the things we love and not have too much of them That's for fear right. of Rodin not liking like, them. It's like, a, it's, like a fine, it's like a fine dessert or a fine like spice. You we've talked like, about like- Can't have too much of We've it. talked about getting sick of certain food items before, right? Like I told you about how my, sure when my have. mom discovered, you know- Sam's Club when I was a kid and bought like oh, like the honey buns. Yes, she yeah. bought like a massive tray of honey buns, which I was super excited. I know we've about. talked about. I don't know if we talked about this on the yeah, podcast. Yeah, oh my sure god, don't don't it. even don't even talk to me about a honey bun now. Let like, us know if we just... talked about honey buns before. I know Drew and I brought it up many times. Yeah. offline. Like I know. can't I can't do a honey bun anymore or yeah. Airheads. She did the same thing. She's like, hey kids, we got Airheads. I'm like, oh my oh, god, man. you got like a whole box of Airheads. This is amazing. You can definitely <laughs> overdo Airheads. Oh, that god. like makes your tongue sore. Oh god, no. You know, never again. Do you have anything you used to like and now you hate because you ate too much of it? Oh, I got some stories. <laughs> well, I know, you know me. Yeah. I know you've got a story. Apple like, cinnamon Cheerios is one yep, that I still can't do. Yeah, I made yep. myself sick eating too many of those one yep. time and have kind of an aversion to it. Yes, that was a, that was um, a tale. Not a big fan of sour cream. Oh. As I was like a five-year-old, I was given it as a joke being oh, told no. that it was whipped cream. <gasps> no. So I just took like a big old spoonful of it oh, and was like. Oh, no. That I is drama. Never liked it ever since. Oh, I don't blame you. I mean, I, I can not... like barely take it now if it's like like slightly mixed into something and it's not a prominent flavoring oh, but if i can like really taste it oh nope. yeah that that would be tough to recover from yeah oh man it's 
weird. It's weird the stuff that sticks with you from like childhood. Yeah. You know, something oh. as innocuous as like one little instance like that, that is like terrible. set me on a path the rest of my life. Yeah. You know? I don't know. Oof. But yeah, uh, most other things though, I'm, yeah, even if I eat a lot of it, I usually come back around to it. All right. Usually, if I eat a lot of it, it's because I like it. Glad to hear it. I, you know, continue eating it. <laughs> um, anyway, what are you talking about, pens? Um, kind of along the lines of Rodden, uh, pretty much Yurushi, like of all types, basically. Mm-hmm. I find all of it to be pretty fascinating. You know, I like the ones that are, you know, um, more, art, uh, I don't know, artistic. It's all artistic, so it's hard to say. I mean, just like a plain black Yurushi pen is, is beautiful, and I like that for what it is. But Certainly. I love the, you know, the more expressive kind of stuff. Yeah. It's very interesting. You like stories too. I like stories. You yeah. like it when there's a story love, being I like played s- out in the stories. Pen. Yeah. I'm pretty picky about the stories that I like, but that's not unusual for most people, I think. Um, but I love like nature. Like that's why I love the Japanese pen so much is because I really like, I mean, I love being outdoors. I love nature, you know, things. And there's a lot of like nature themed Yurushi pens. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's really cool. I, I like that. And I just love the, the technique and the artistry that I know that goes into the Yurushi pens. Um, I really like bicolored nibs. Oh yeah, you do. Know. You I've mentioned always, that recently. Even before I got into fountain pens, I was always I always liked you know like watches with like a watch band that was like a gold and stainless like combination, like these types of things. I've always been into you know metal combo, like combo colored metals. Um, so yeah, I've always liked that bicolored nibs. Like ooh, like the Pilot, the custom Yurushi nib is just. Gorgeous, and a lot of their like special edition pens they've done do do bicolored nibs. Or um, Sailor's got beautiful bicolored nibs. They do. So yeah, I really like those elements. Again, I'm kind of all over the place here. Um, I love the Homo sapiens lava material. Oh yeah, and you pretty much only get that on the Homo sapiens. Yeah, you mentioned when we were doing our Franken pen that that would be the material your yeah, dream pen would have. That would just be so cool to have that material in yeah. other pens. I mean, it's not likely that that would. I mean, Piscani hasn't. Even, to my knowledge, I don't think they've ever used it on a pen other than the Homo sapiens, have they? I don't think they have. I don't think so. It's like so iconic to the Homo sapiens. I don't think they, they I don't even think they've used it on another Visconti pen. Yeah. But I mean, it would be kind of cool. So I don't know. Um, that'd be kind of neat to see in some other options. Um, and then this is a weird one, but I like individually numbered pens. Not necessarily like limited edition, like a certain number out of something. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, something about just having like a run of numbers on a pen. Like we try to do that whenever we can. I know Delta, that was like always their thing. They numbered every pen and it would just like be running number into infinity. Um, but I don't know, something about it. It's like pens are so unique and special and I know the care and like that goes into menu designing and manufacturing basically every single pen. Um, so I don't know, when a pen is individually numbered, it just feels like that much more personal. I agree. Me. Even whatever the number is, I don't really care as much. But I don't know, it's kind of special. I agree. Yeah. I think it is. I like that too. And then last one, um, just anodized metals. You know what I mean? We've talked recently recently yeah. about how colored, uh, how those colors just yeah, look like, so special. Like the All Stars or the Quaco All Sports, you know, Diplomat Arrow. Oh, they just have this like glow about them that you just like can't really find in a resin. You know, it looks different. It's not that it's better or worse. It's just I love it's good. those colored metals. It's real good. Yeah. So I don't know. These are just random random like uh, musings of pen features that I that I like. Not exclusive, not an exclusive list. I like other things. I too. like all those too. Yeah, just random stuff. The spring loaded inner cap or there's an inner cap okay. period. Like absolutely. I, that's the one I agree with you the most on. Like I wish yeah. that was in every, it makes such a big difference. What is the ideal like inner cap for you? Like of all the ones you've seen, what would be, if you could take one spring loaded inner cap, this is such a nerdy pen question. But if you could take one cap and put it on every single one of your pens somehow, which one would you choose? I mean, I don't know if it's just the cap or it, its relationship to the feed. Yeah, but yeah, okay. but I think that Twisby has figured out how to seal their pens so well hmm. that they write after like a year of, hmm. you know, a neglect. Those are pretty solid. Like that, I wish that I just want all pens to do that. If all hmm. fountain pens sealed as well as Twisby. And for that matter, the Platinum 3776 or the Estabrook SD. The 3776 Century one yeah. to me is like all, pretty all, primo. All great. I would be happy with any of those. I just think that people would enjoy their pens more if that was the case for all fountain pens. And yeah. that would make me happy. You know, obviously, yeah. we'd get fewer emails about pens drying out. No, no, I have to clean it. It's all gunked up. But 
I just want yeah. people to enjoy themselves with these pens, and yeah. that would help with the enjoyment factor big time. Yeah. I also like a good spring-loaded clip. I was just playing with this one, and there's just enough behind the joint for you Euphoria. to. Uh, yeah. Now it's not really spring-loaded, but it's a rocker. It's clip. like a yeah, it's and a that, rocker clip. That yeah. I like. I don't like having to like lift up the front of the clip and push it onto stuff. Like, come on, just leave a little bit yeah, of room. Yeah, that can get a little awkward. Sometimes. Leave a little bit of room in the back so you can just kind of like that is pretty push cool. it up. Rocker like, clips, that's a big plus. You don't get that on a lot of pens. No, but every, like it's not hard. You just, you know, put some extra clip behind the point where it goes into the cap. Yeah, not all clip designs lend itself to well, that. But, yeah, you yeah. know, it's certainly, if it was designed from the ground up to be that way, there's no reason you couldn't put that type of rocket yeah. clip on. So I'm just a big fan of that. And it just, it okay. makes it more practical. Okay. Um, I also like an easily disassemblable converter. Like, yeah, the, you don't always like, get that. like the platinum converter, you unscrew the shroud and like, why, like it's, it just makes the headache of cleaning a pen so much less of a headache when you can just disassemble your converter without having to like bend and twist and pry. Mm. Like I, I would pay a little bit extra. I would play, I would pay platinum prices oof, to um, have a, just a better, more easily disassemblable converter mm. um, on all my pens. Platinum's got a rock solid converter. They do. I mean, you pay for it, but it's, you pay for it, it's but very it, it solid. Works. Yeah, I get and it, it seats just so positively too. Mm -hmm. Like you, it like seats on there, and then you push it. What seems like half an inch. Yeah. It's not that much, but it like gives you it's such like confidence. Yeah. That like, I had a funny instance. <laughs> What was I doing? I think I was doing the nib nook for the custom 743. Yeah. Because we got recent. all those new nibs. And when I do nib nooks, you know, I'm I'm using, you know, every type of pen. I'm not like keeping every single type of pen for me personally. So I try not to use the converters that the pen comes with because I have all these other pilot converters. So I had like all these old converters of my own that I just grabbed. And one, because I was doing so many pens at once, I was like digging deep into my stash. And I had one converter that was like an old school Pilot Con 50, mm -hmm. which was disassemblable. But I had disassembled and reassembled it so many times. It just like was not like super like firm grabby anymore. Oh. So when I went to go and fill the thing, it like the piston from the converter basically like pushed and like unscrewed the, <laughs> unscrewed the, the, you know, front half of the converter with the whole grip of the pen and everything in there and just plopped it right down into my bottle of ink. Oh God. Which it's for the nib nook. So it was a bottle of Noodler's Black, which is tall and deep. So it just completely bloop and has oh. disappeared into this Noodler's is it in Black. There now? And I had to like fish it out. Oh, no, you I had to it. fish okay. it out. And, yeah, because I had to do the nib nook and everything. But I was just like, <laughs> you know, I was just kind of like, dum -da dum dum. And it was like, plunk. I was like, what the hell? Oh, my converter just, you know. Completely disassembled itself oh, unintentionally, and I was so like, that, "That one I'm gonna, I'm gonna, went into the I'm graveyard." Retire that converter, yeah. you know, or I could like put a little bit of glue on it or something. Yeah, Recipes like, seal it up. Yeah, I got some old ones, but I mean that converter is at least ten years old. <laughs> you know what? I also like now. This is something only one pen company does, mm. and this pen company puts their nibs on feed rails. Feed rails, and that's Lamy. Yeah, they do. So no other company does that. But it makes it so easy for people to swap Plat nibs. Platinum, the the um, not plazier. Now I will I will say that the preppy the preppy plazier nib is a little bit not as like you can't really easy get those all, up. but it is it not is not so much the pro, the Procyon kind of, Procyon two has got well, sort of a similar design. So there is I will say that the um the gold the the small gold um mm. platinum nib I mm -hmm. think is on like rails what's on a little the, bit. Like on the Kanazawa leaf. Yeah, UKAs well, but th stuff. those those are more like, I would say those nibs are more crimped onto the feed yeah. than on rails. Like the rails of the Lamy pens, you know, not yeah, the, not know the 2000, it's... but all those, those, those are actual rails that the pen is, yeah. that the nib is meant to slide on and off of. That's a good point. That's the other point. ones are crimped on and you can pull them off, but it's not really a rail yeah. system. And there's more to the nib that like slides up into the grip of the pen. Lamy's kind of unique in that the whole nib itself is- Is exposed. Outside of, you the, can remove, outside of the grip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can remove That's the, true. the nib without messing with the feed at all. That's true. That is, that is how the uh, Preppy and the Plazier nibs are. They're not as easy to slide off. Yeah. And it, I don't know if you'd call it more of a crimp or whatever. It's a crimp, definitely. But it, it looks similar, but still, Lamy is way easier to replace. Yeah, those. I like that. And I, I think that, you know, one of the great things about fountain pens is swapping nibs and being able to try different sizes. And I think that that would make a lot of pens a lot more fun. Hmm. Let's say if it was a number six nib or something that had more hmm. of a, more accessibility. I think you'd have to have smaller nibs do that because it wouldn't be able to go back down into the feed. Hmm. 
But that's uh, where things anyway. get a little complicated. Yeah, yeah, it does. But I st it's still a design element that mm. I like, and I wish I saw more of. Yeah. Um, and breather hole shapes, Brian. We were just talking about the shape of heart and yeah. how platinum has a heart shape in their breather hole. Uh, why not make some more crazy shapes? Why not, you know, a square or a triangle? It doesn't have to be crazy. Just something different. Like or everybody why just not make it crazy. I, I mean, I'm just saying I don't need it to be crazy. Like it's just everybody does a, a circle. lightning bolt. Dude, yeah, absolutely. A TCB. star, like something. Like a star. we, we Ooh. have the technology to make a different shape hole. It's not wacky. So bring it on. Like I want some crazy holes. All right. And then finally, rhodium plating. Montegrappa rhodium plates their steel nibs. Oh yeah. And it makes them look like gold nibs. Steel I know nib. it's an expensive process, but I think it makes such a huge and it doesn't even change difference. the color. No, but it makes it look so shiny and yeah. beautiful. Oh my God. I love it. Does it. Look classy. And, and the quality of steel is so high right now. Oftentimes mm. I don't find myself needing a gold nib. I really don't. Not always. Yeah. Um, it's not I'm, a deal breaker. Yeah, I'm I'm totally fine with with having a steel nib. Yeah. But if you said, "Hey, would you rather pay an extra fifty dollars or so, seventy five dollars, to have a rhodium plated steel nib?" Like, yeah, I think I would. Like, hmm. I it, that, you care about it that much, really? Seventy five. Just for, I don't I don't know if I I mean if yeah, you think yeah. about like how much you would pay to have that nib upgraded to gold you're probably talking like 150. Yeah, that's so so to be... so if you were able to say would you pay half that for a rhodium plated steel nib? Yeah, mm, I would. I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would. It, I like it, but I don't know if I like it that much. I think for some pens that are really high quality that you're already paying over three hundred dollars for. Yeah, I guess it depends on the like, pen. Like, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and ramp it up. I mean, to a point maybe, but I don't know if I, I don't know if I would pay seventy five dollars. And they do look good though, right? They, I, they do look really they good. They look real. It's good. hard to say. Like Mon Monograppa two is like my only basis for I know. what that would look like. So that's true. It's hard to say. Yeah. But yeah, valid, valid opinion though. Valid cool. Opinion. So right. There you go. Cool. But all I do right. like all the years too. Awesome. All right, um, I got a question for you, Drew, from yeah. Zach Lemon. Hi, Zach. Uh, so Zach asks, favorite pen for frequent ink changes, like easy to clean, easy to fill, et cetera. I will say, to kick things off, I've been using, oh, well, let's just situate here, here we go. Oh yeah, look at this, both of us. <laughs> <laughs> I've been using the Pilot Parallel recently, and- um, oh, That's a good one. If you grab a hold of that front section, like the colored part, yeah, uh, yeah. It, the whole feed just slides right yeah, out. Yeah, like that whole unit with the it plates just, and the- yeah, Effortlessly, just, yeah, yeah. I, so I love that. I just recently remembered how easy that is to clean. Now the nib, that's a whole other thing. So I'm not gonna say that one is it, Yeah. Um, but I will say what is it is the Pilot Explorer slash Kakuno. I do. Th I'm, I'm going to say Explorer okay. because that's what I use. I use that you, more than the you Kakuno. Say the Explorer, wouldn't you? I, well, I use it more. I like the Kakuno <laughs> affordability. Like Kakuno is good too. I mean, Kakuno. it's the same. It's the same guts of the pen. It is. It is. But but why I say those two and not the Explorer? Yeah. Uh, sorry, and not the Metropolitan is because the Metropolitan doesn't have a clear grip section or a translucent grip section anyway. Um, yeah, but then also that like helps to hide anything that you leave right, behind but, but, in but, there. But, but you know? no, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you can make a case for that. Yeah. So the Kakuno and the Explorer both have translucent and clear so it's either smoke or clear True. grip sections you get, so you that, get to that's see what a plus you get to see what you're yeah. working with you get to see if there's any condensation left over or little inky bits mm -hmm. um if you have so my my choice is a an explorer so i can see what's in the grip section see how dirty or clean it is Fair. with a refillable cartridge so i would empty that cartridge out refill it and then to clean you just take an ink syringe and blast it one time with a full syringe of ink and you, sorry, full syringe of water, and you can get almost all of that ink out there, if not all of it. You, yeah, you, you do a follow up blast, but yeah, so easy to clean out. Yeah. They hold a ton, way more than. If you're like me and you leave your pens for months at a time to where the ink like dries up in there, you might have to. Might have to do it a couple of times. Yeah, or, or get a Shove new, a Q-tip in there new, uh, or something, you know, but it's, yeah, well, it's still pretty easy. Q-tip would fit in those Pilot On a Pilot one, yeah, it will. It will. That's beautiful. Not all cartridges. Not a Stainer International, but like right. Pilot and like Sailor, like the ones with really fat openings, yep. Q-tips work pretty well. Absolutely. So they're easy to clean in that regard. Um, and the feeds are easy to pull as well. So the, the feed mm -hmm. has, a, it, it ejects pretty lengthily out of the grip mm -hmm. section there. Yeah. It's easy to get a hold of. It's not too slick. It's kind of like a, yeah. a more rough matte texture. Like more of a matte, yeah. Easy yeah. to grab a hold of, easy to pull out, mm -hmm. and, and very, it's very sturdy very too. Exactly. It yeah. You don't feel like you're gonna break it. I would have said Twisby because Twisby's easy to clean too, but the feeds are the a little spins more. Are, that is yeah. precarious. Yeah. So I pick. I'm picking Pilot for this mm. one, and I'm also picking these pens because the nib that you'll find on the Explorer, on the Metro, on the Kakuno, 
um, is keyed to the feed, meaning mm. the nib itself has these little kind of hooks into the on the sides of the nib that fits into notches or grooves on the feed itself. It's very intentional. So you like can't you can tell miss a line yeah. the nib. So when you're sandwiching them both together, putting them back into the grip section, you know you're doing it right every yeah. time. So removing the nib in the feed is essential if you want to get a deep clean. And this allows you to do that very quickly, very easily. So the, like disassembly process is really important for your like your for your picks here. For for well yeah I mean if you know favorite pen for frequent ink changes it says easy to clean and fill. So like, as far as for me Easy to clean means easy to disassemble. I fully support that because I'm maybe not the best about cleaning my pens regularly. What? But in theory, if you are, if your pen is easier to clean, you hopefully won't be in that position where you have to like disassemble and deep clean it as much because you'll be able to flush it out more yeah. often and then it's, you know, not caking up in there. So, so yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. a huge fan of those pens and they write yeah. and they write Solid. every time. Yeah. That's, yeah. Well, the reliable writer is also really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, pretty much any, which these pens certainly fall into my category of like pretty much any cartridge converter pen, mm -hmm. pretty easy to deal with because I mean, single best tip ever that I've discovered in the fountain pen world has been using a bulb syringe to flush out the grip section of a pen. It just makes it like, just like you, it's like fast pass at Disney world. You yes. just like skip the line, yep. go straight to the front, enjoy the best of it. Like you just flush it out. makes it cleaning pretty much any pen. I've Almost started no effort. I've started anytime I give a fountain pen to someone who doesn't already have one. I always give, give them a bowl syringe. Yeah. They're, they're like, like, what, what is this? Is Why it? is this? You know, you're like, just go with me. Yep. It's weird, but yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I know when we do, you know, we've done a number of ink reviews and stuff like that that we've posted on our blog and stuff over the years, done an ink review videos, um, which we haven't done as much recently, but you know, back in the day we did a plenty. Um, standardized on a Lamy Safari, but it doesn't have to exclusively be a Lamy Safari. The reason we liked using this specifically for ink reviews is because not only is it easy to flush out because it's a cartridge converter, a lot of people have that pen, so they kind of are aware of it, but you can swap the nib out with the pen still inked. So you can you see like, oh, this is what the ink looks like when it's in a fine nib. This is what it looks like in a broad or a stub. So that was kind of a unique, I guess, case for what we were using it mm -hmm. for, but it kind of fits in the same vibe of just being really, you know, usable. Um, and then honestly, I like pens that are um, maybe even not cartridge converters, but are piston fill like Twisbees that are easy to disassemble. So it's like a solid body, but you can disassemble the back out of it. You can like pull the mechanism out of the back. Now, if you're like taking the whole piston mechanism apart, that's where things can get tricky with Twisbees. Yeah. Some people struggle with that. We have videos on it, but you know. I wouldn't say that get... like for, for, for frequent ink changes though, See, uh, so, well, my judgment, my judgment on that is if you're not like putting the piston all the way down to where it might like come out when you try to pull the thing out, but if you're only moving it about halfway down, you know, just, you're just unscrewing that cap enough to fit the wrench in there. Just to get there, the wrench in there, okay. Then it's not, the, it's not that difficult to keep the whole unit together. You can even keep the wrench like up in there yeah. and keep that whole unit set it aside. And then you basically can take the whole front of the pen and flush it with the bulb syringe, just like you would a cartridge converter. That's true. Okay. So yes, it's not maybe as easier convenient that's more of a thing like you know i wouldn't necessarily like if i was going through and getting like 20 ink samples and testing them out i maybe would not pick like a piston fill pen to yeah. do that per se but you know it's also not the worst thing in the world and and i can make a case for that being one yeah no it's a, that it's a, pretty it's a good little too. hack too yeah nice little nice little hack yeah cool all right, all right. Next uh question. question number three is from arturo mm. and arturo says Besides artists and or fountain pen and lettering enthusiasts, which community is your biggest consumer for fountain pens? Mm. Here in Mexico, he's wearing a lab coat, I believe. Mm. Uh, it's definitely the medical community. I barely know anyone else outside this group. Okay. So That's a really good question, actually. Yeah, it is. Which, so apart from fountain pen enthusiasts. I think it's says, assumed that like, you know, lettering enthusiasts and yeah. you know, people like that may be in, inclined to do it. Sure. Um, so I would say, you know, we don't have any like firm data on this. We're not like big brother collecting no. that kind of stuff, nor, no. nor are there like super clearly defined communities, like sub communities within the fountain pen Other world. than football mascots. Um, uh, big fans of fountain pens. Is that pens. so? Yeah. Most okay. of them, most of our viewers actually. Oh, I did not know that. Yep. I learned something new every day. You can day. tell, you can tell. So you can just tell by looking at yeah, them. Yeah, that one right there. That's right. Definitely. You know. 
you were a former uh, mascot, weren't you, Drew? I, uh, you were I, a high school mascot. I, share, I shared mascot responsibilities right. with someone in high school, That's yes. right. So maybe just like you you know. Maybe I'm projecting. Like you, you can, no, I think you connect. Like you can oh, tell. Oh, that's it. So you know like what's a, weird? I'm like terrified of those. I always have been. I'm like, I don't I don't trust anybody in a costume. Like, who are you? Why would you? You don't know who. You don't no, know what's going on in there. I don't trust myself either. You don't know who's in there, what's happening. Yeah. Crazy. That's pretty funny. Anyway. Um, yeah. So obviously football mascots would be number one. But apart from that, um, you know, we're just going to have to kind of, you know, have conjecture around yeah, all this yeah. because we don't really I mean, we've been talking really to people know, but, for, you know over a decade about fountain pens so we have we have so we got some sense so we're kind of just going to like speak around it more i'm not going to give you any like you know firm uh thing to like grab onto and really uh take to the judge i get i don't even know what i'm trying to say there mm -hmm. but whatever um and i would say that there's not everybody falls cleanly into one group either i think a yeah. lot of people use fountain pens for a lot of different reasons and might fall into a number of groups so. yeah i don't know if um arturo is specifically mentioning like jobs or occupations yeah maybe or general communities i'm not sure i would i would you know the thing i will say is that when it comes to like occupations it really spans across so many different industries i think we've I mean, got everybody medical community you think of like lawyers you know doctors dentists you know whoever it might be you know obviously like fountain pens are kind of a discretionary item so you would tend to associate people being into them who have, you know, more discretionary income. So you could certainly, you know, say any type of, you know, profession that might lend itself more towards that. But, but that's definitely not the case. It's not certainly not exclusive. And no. I, you know, I don't I couldn't say like any one particular profession like dominates um, the no. fountain pen community. No. I think it really I mean, we hear teachers, first responders, students. Um, a lot of people just in like their regular office jobs, you know, just work in whatever. If they are in insurance or they do administrative stuff or who who knows what. Um, a lot of people are into fountain pens just because they're into it, you know, which is amazing. I think that's the best part about it is it's really kind of open to anybody who can write with a pen. Yep. Um, which is super cool. So, you know, I would probably lump the largest community into maybe one of the ones that you said was, you know, besides this group, but just fountain pen enthusiasts in general. People are just using fountain pens in their daily life just for the joy of using the fountain pens um and that's that's probably by far dominates who make up our customers at least um you know doing daily to-do lists and maybe some journaling and just kind of that that kind of a stuff um then i think next might be people who are into like collecting so people who m maybe not so much for investment purposes per se, that they certainly could with like some limited editions, a little bit of speculative purchasing there. Um, I think there have been periods of time, you know, like in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, where there was more of that maybe going on, like speculative buying, you know, collecting, like that type of thing. Yeah. Um, that's where a lot of limited editions really started to kind of come up. Um, certain brands like Mont Blanc and stuff like that were really known for that. Um, uh, but I think that there's, you know, some people who are either, whether they're into like history or they're into like particular brands or, you know, they really like, you know, say rodden pens or Urushi pens, or they mm. like different, <laughs> uh, they like different, you know, techniques or certain types of, you know, nibs or materials or whatever it might be. They might be collecting for this, you know, with a kind of an intentional purpose. Um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good size group. Um, but I don't know that they And like. it's usually not the only thing they collect either. Probably not, you know, probably serial collectors of some kind. Um, but I would I would say that like people who collect certain brands or certain groups may tend to huh, collect themselves into groups that are like into that thing. Probably because like, say, if you collect, you know, vintage Esther Brooks or something like that, you know, there's not that many people that are going to even know what the heck you're talking about. So those people may gather and find each other and become kind of their own little sub community. So I could certainly see that being um, a group. Um, and then, you know, kind of relating to some of like the career stuff, I see, I would say like anybody who's certainly in like a more technical field, uh, maybe more inclined towards fountain pens, you know, they're kind of technical instruments. We see like scientists, architects, um, certainly people in the medical community would fall in this group, in, in um, IT like, professionals, uh, yeah, in you any, know, like analog field too. Like anybody who has a, you know, mm. appreciation for a tactile instrument, you know, yeah, craftsmanship. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know a number of like chemists and physicists mm -hmm. and stuff like that who, you know, often will be writing a lot of formulas and like other things down and then can appreciate the more, you know, intentional aspects of different pen designs and ink choices and stuff like that. So certainly, 
So you, you know, people who have that type of work. Um, I would say people who are artists probably fall into another group. You know, that can be broken down into subgroups as well. I'm thinking about like urban sketchers, mm -hmm. you know, people who like to go out. They're a very, you know, social bunch as well. So they might gather together, get together at a cafe, sketch, you know, some of the scenery around them. And fountain pens may fall into their toolkit, though not exclusively, right? But again, within um, that little community, you could be, you know, looking at a half dozen different occupations. Oh, 100%. All over the place. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, you know, the whole thing is like, there's not really a barrier so much in like terms of what you do. It's more just what your interest is. Um, and I think, honestly, we probably got a lot of people in the fountain pen community where their job has nothing to do with anything related to fountain pens or writing, maybe even in general. But it's almost like kind of an, a creative outlet or a bit of an escape yes. for them. Thinking specifically like IT professionals, like if you're coding all day, why in the world would you need a fountain pen? You literally work on a computer all day. Or like if you're doing graphic design or any of these types of things, but you'd be surprised, or maybe not, maybe you are one of those people. <laughs> you'd be surprised the number of people that are working in a technical field that appreciate the analog nature of a fountain pen. Um, we kind of kind of fall into that category too. Most of what we do is like on a computer and yeah. screens and like this kind of stuff. It's all computers. Like it's, you got to like intentionally print out a piece of paper yeah. here. I like to write. write yeah, on, I, like to, I like to, you know, yeah. take notes with my pen during the pen cast. For sure. Um, and yeah, I take notes all day at work. And, and yeah, shout out to the people who don't have, you know, a, you know, occupation that, you know, a kid could draw a picture of you on a little piece of paper or somebody that's just in a, you know, a workplace that- I want to grow up to be an insurance broker. Yeah, or like, like you know, I want to be a title examiner at a foreclosure firm. You know, some some of you Living out there- Living the dream. Yeah, I know some of you out there <laughs> just, this pen is, you know, a safety net for you working a job that you do not love, but you need to stay there because it's just what needs to happen in your life right now for you to get by. But just keep the- Keep the pen, keep us near, and you know we're here. We are for here you, for you. Yeah. We are here for you. I've been there. It, it's it's a nightmare, and I wish I had a pen to you know help me through it. But yeah, uh, yeah that that's that's probably a good portion of the. No, pen not insignificant. Well, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure it's a bright spot in a lot of people's day. It know? is. Um, and then you know certainly other other more creative pursuits too. I think like certainly anybody who's like an an, uh, 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 an author, like a novelist, a poet, certain like that. Somebody who works with words. That maybe feels more natural to like have a nice pen, right? Um, calligrapher, you know, hand lettering enthusiasts, those types of folks, they probably won't exclusively use fountain pens, but it might fit into their toolkit. Um, watercolor, mixed media artists, basically anybody like expressing themselves with some sort of creative endeavor, fountain pens as a tool might certainly make sense. Um, and then, um, you know, this has kind of ebbed and flowed in popularity, um, but I, I'll lump them all into one group called planner people. Mm -hmm. um, so whether it's like bullet journaling, like productivity enthusiasts, uh, scrapbookers, you know, kind of people in that world, people who are, you know, maybe not creating art for the sake of like, you know, displaying it or some, ex you know, expression there, but like are more into productivity and organizing in some fashion and then are using like bits of creativity with their tools, you know, kind of throughout their journals or their planners or whatever. There's certainly a large group of those folks that overlap into the fountain pen world as well. Um, and there's probably others, but these are some of the ones that kind of stand out to me the most. But I mean, the main theme, kind of what Arturo was hitting on here, I don't, I don't know that it's exclusively any one like you know, community in terms of like occupation or anything like that. No, and, you if you know, go to a fountain pen show and you start asking people what they do, you're going to get a cornucopia yeah. variety. But what is kind of fascinating is like uh, the number of like forums or other groups that have nothing to do with fountain pens that'll have a subgroup or a sub forum related to fountain pens, yeah. whether it's like wet shaving or knitting or some other like enthusiast hobby. And then you find out there's like a sub forum on fountain pens within that group. Um, I would say, you know, if there's one other group, probably knitting would be the biggest one that I can think of. Like Ravelry.com is a huge forum with like a million plus members. They have a very active fountain pen sub forum on there. So they might fall into the biggest group that I can like point to and say, there is a large community of people there that are active that are in also into fountain pens. Maybe that would be it, but it's probably about the best I got. So anyway, fun question to think about anyway. Yeah, that's solid. All right, cool. Next question for you, Drew. Okay. From SN11. Love the pencast as always. For the QA slash hypothetical, what existing fountain pen for sale would you choose for each main Super Mario character? And I'm glad you took this question because you're the more video game um, 
whatever, uh, uh, adept, savvy, savvy, whatever. I can't even put the words together to s- describe it. But anyway, so uh, here are the characters, Drew. Peach, Mario, Luigi, Toad, Browser. I think that's typo. Bowser. Mm-hmm. Yoshi, though I like Browser, though. That's funny. Uh, Yoshi, Daisy, Wario, Waluigi, and Donkey Kong. This is like the full-on like Mario Kart crew here. It is. Uh, you can add other characters if you want, if that's not enough. No, nope, that's enough. How many how many product images do you feel like finding? Yeah, and right. I'm going to upload this, all these. Uh, uh, all right. So, yeah. So, um, I thought about splitting this up and having Brian do half and me do half, but then I did my half. I'm like, well, that took a long time. I'm not going to make him do that. <laughs> So yeah, here we go. Lots, not... lots of credit for Drew on this one. He really put in the work. All right, here we go. <laughs> We're going to start off with Mario, the main man, mm. and he's going to be a Twisby Go. Not a Twisby Swipe because I needed it to be oh. borderline unbreakable Okay. because Mario is resilient yeah. and unstoppable. He's got to be ready for anything. And the plastic of the Twisby Go is like this, it's like an ABS plastic yeah. where everything else is kind of a more brittle thing. Yeah. The Go, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it gets the job done. Mario's not the prettiest thing no, in the world. No, he's not. He's stout. <laughs> he, he's, you know, he, he, but he is resilient. You mm-hmm. cannot stop the dude. And also, the uh, it, it's reliable. You know, it, it yep. does the job. And also, it's got that bounce. Mm-hmm. It's that spring, uh, con- uh, not a converter, but like the spring piston. What else uh, could you call that? on there. What could you call it? Uh-huh. That? Clicky? clicky? It's what? a spring... Spring... Plunger. plunger! Oh, it took me a second to huh? get that. All right. There we well, go. Well done, Drew. All right. Well done, sir. All right, hang tight. <laughs> Luigi would be a Peniter twin tank touchdown filler. Oh. Because it's long, skinny, Italian, and fills via... Vacuum. Vacuum. Yes. AKA Luigi's, dude, Luigi's Mansion. There fans. we go. Wow. We're getting this done. There's layers to Boom. this, Drew. Those were probably the best ones. It's all downhill from here. Okay, fair um, enough. Peach is going to be a diplomat arrow in antique pink. Very lovely, mm. pretty on the outside, but honestly, durable as heck. Very tough. Yeah. Ready for a battle, and it's not going to crumble easily. Solid. She, she's, she might be uh, pink and fluffy on the exterior. Peach needs her own game. But... Uh, all, I'm most of the other characters are getting. Yeah. She doesn't have one. Nintendo, yet. if you're listening, Peach needs yeah. her own game. She is the unsung hero of this whole franchise. She 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 gets crap done. When she she definitely showed it in the Mario movie, and she, Mario was consistently I, in more trouble than she was ever. She was fine. Good. Honestly, good. Mario. She deserves early. her time yeah. in the spotlight. She gets it. Um, and then also, I thought that the diplomat arrow, those kind of like. Um, cutouts in the arrow kind of looked like a pleated dress in the way they kind of like came down oh that's a good thought yeah okay so i have an anecdote go. here because i know rachel's never going to watch this so rachel peach is her go-to oh, character yeah. in mario we her and i played a lot of mario kart a lot of mario party mm-hmm. in our day she swears now rachel's a really intelligent person but i do not understand her logic on this she swears that in all of the mario party games where you have to ground pound she swears that the dress gives Peach the advantage because it causes her to like ground pound harder or faster or whatever. And I'm like, what is your logic here? She's like the dress. It's like, you know, it adds to that. And I'm like, the dress is like a parachute, which would like slow you down. Mm-hmm. Like, what is your logic? She, she will not take any reasonable argument to it. She stands by it. But in she other, also beats me in most of the games. So games, I, it's hard Peach to dispute. uses but... the dress to float. It is... I have argued all of these no. points of logic, but you know, so I'm not going to win that one. I I'm guess. not going to win all it. Right. I'm not going to win it, but I do give her a hard time about it often. As and you should. She never wavers. She's a she's a committed. She's committed to that one. Anyway. Keep up the good work. <laughs> um, Toad is going to be a Kaveco Supra because in mm. its compact form, it is quite tiny and diminutive yet strong. Mm. But uh, there's a moment in the Mario movie recently where he just decides to drive around in a monster truck. So I feel like Toad nice. can be surprising. Every now and then he can go into a gigantic scary mode. Well, so, uh, and if you want to add another layer to it, Drew, you know, in its smallest form, you can take out that middle section. It's nice and compact. But, you know, in the Mario game, when you eat the mushroom, you get bigger. Yeah, and you yeah. can do that with the Supra. There you go. So you can, like, Absolutely. supersize it, you know? Supersize. Supersize it. All right. Daisy was a bit of a weird one. I don't know a lot about Daisy, but I know yeah. she's orange and she has flowers. And the Retro Pop Orange Pilot Metropolitan is orange and has flowers. And uh, okay. there you go. 
Um, she is also pretty um, utilitarian. I think she's less prissy than Daisy uh, than Peach is. I think she's more boots on the ground type. So yeah, there's nothing. There's a, the Metropolitan's pretty utilitarian. She's not a princess, right? Yeah, she's she's gonna get it done. Yeah, the Yo Yoshi Mario's. You know, no, wait, is she a princess? I think she is. Daisy's a princess? Yeah, Daisy's a princess. Okay, she was the princess in the oh, Game Boy game, Super Mario Land. Okay. Um, but then now I think they switched her over, so she, I think, is Luigi's love interest. I don't know. Um, hmm. Yoshi, Mario's loyal steed. Are Daisy and Peach sisters? No. They're just like there? They're just there. They're just associated uh, Daisy's somehow? just kind of like a Peach okay. clone. All right. But not, not actually, but like I think in the video game, she was just meant to be another princess. Okay. Okay, Yoshi. Um, he's going to be a pilot parallel in 3.8 because it has a it's white green. barrel, a green cap, and more importantly, with a 3.8 nib, it eats everything you feed it quickly. <laughs> nice. Bowser, the king of the Koopas, is going to be the Visconti Opera Master in combustion. Oh, It's big, nice. it's heavy, it's black, and it's fiery, yeah. and hence the opera name, if you've seen the Mario movie, a little musical. Okay. Because uh, I need to see this movie. Jack Black does the voice, so that tells you all you need to know right that there. That was honestly probably the thing I was like most excited about yeah. for this movie. He has he has a couple moments. Nice. Um, and Donkey Kong. I chose another opera master for Donkey Kong because historically in the Mario Kart games, Bowser and Donkey Kong share the same set of attributes. They are slow to start, but have a high top speed. Okay. Um, so Donkey Kong is going to be using the Opera Master Savannah, mm. which has some pretty solid banana vibes, like some of us do today. Um, you could argue I got banana vibes yeah, happening right now. I was, was that I was not uh, stealthily implying that. <laughs> um, so it's got it's brown and yellow. So you got monkey and banana, uh, ape and banana, excuse me. Yeah, happening. You could also go with the yellow safari. That's just a straight up banana pen. And then finally, um, uh, well not finally, Wario is uh, going to be the Bennu Briolet in Luminous Neon because hmm. it is thick in the middle and obnoxious. <laughs> it, you're not wrong about that. There we go. And finally, my favorite, Waluigi, is going to be the preppy Wah! <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I had to do that one. I like that. That's just... Why does Waluigi pull out a rose in his like little ending sequence and all the I don't know the he's a romantic Mario Party I guess games. is he I don't know he's not romantic he's pretty like haphazard and awkward I've and actually never played a game that featured Waluigi in it nothing features Waluigi oh he he's just only like a up. side character yeah. this is another thing my kids bring up all the time yeah I don't like, know Wario has his own whole series of things Wait, I love the Wario I remember playing the Wario game on the original Game Boy that was awesome yeah you have the Waluigi pinball level now in Mario Kart series, which is like the only love that Waluigi really gets. But he was always just like side. Does, any, does anybody asking for it? He's my go-to in Mario Party. Is he really? Waluigi is. What? Yeah. That's funny. Mainly because like if you hit the button that makes them make the noise, it's really annoying. <laughs> so I just like to troll everybody. Waluigi's <laughs> 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 number one. He's got this really nasally voice. Anyway. So good. there you go. Preppy, Those are my Mario pens. There you go. Pretty solid, Drew. Thank you. Not a bad list. Thank you. You did better than I would have done All with right. that question. That's something. So good, good choosing. All right. All right. Good okay. Beefred21 is mm. asking us in our fifth question today, my Twisby Eco nibs feel more flexible than, than when they were new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I writing too hard? Thanks. Thanks. Um, it's hard to say. Yeah. I don't really know how to answer this question fully just with this information. Um, so I'll have to kind of speak to its principles. I would say if you're writing with a lot of pressure, maybe, but you would have to be writing with a lot of pressure on a regular basis, but not so much pressure that you're flexing the tines. That was my thing. And like springing the tines. Uh, yeah. It's So it's a really fine like band of writing pressure that you'd have to kind of fall in yeah. for this to kind of apply. So I'm going to say as a more general rule, probably not a whole lot. Like you're not likely to take your stainless steel nib and just like flex, it, like make it softer, but still function perfectly normal. <laughs> I mean, you can certainly over flex it and you can spread those tines, make it right, you know, wetter. You can certainly like widen, you know, the slit by kind of bending it out a little bit. Steel nibs are a little more forgiving in doing that than gold nibs are. Um, 
But is that naturally just going to happen over time? Not so much. I've had steel nibs that I've been writing with for a long time, and they have not changed. Yeah. But I, I don't write with them every day. I mean, it could be true, that, true. you know, B. Fred is like a heavy user of this. I mean, I would say like it's 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 possible. Like nibs are made of metal. Metal over time, especially with pressure, mm -hmm. it's going to flex and give, and it's going to get more flexible over time. But, you know, what kind of time frame are we talking about here? You're probably talking years with regular use. But again, enough pressure to flex it, but not so much that you spring it. It's kind of a narrow band to fall in there. So I will say it's, it's certainly possible. I guess if it's heavy daily use for over with a, five with a years. generally heavy hinge. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Yeah. It's possible. Um, probably what would be more likely to happen would be that the nib itself will have flexed out a little bit, will have sprung a little bit, and it will just write broader or wetter. Yeah. Not necessarily more flexible. I've definitely seen that happen. Yeah, and certainly like it's not going to have more spring back than it would. So even if you're flexing it out, if you're you know weakening that metal over lots and lots and lots of flexing, it's not going to spring back more easily, which part of a flexible nib is the ability to flex out, but also to spring back to its original shape. You're not really gonna have that with just wear over time. Right. You're, it's gonna just kind of like give out, you know, it's a one -way street. give up its integrity over yeah. time. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna generally say like, maybe it's possible under the very right circumstances, but as a general rule, it's not really gonna be the ex in anticipated experience that you should no, have because, with a steel nib. Because it's what you're describing is a deterioration. More or less, You know, a yeah. structural loss of integrity, not, you know, uh, like it's losing its, like the metal, metal when it bends over time like that, the connective, I don't know, like connective tissue or whatever, like the things <laughs> that connect it, they they break and they um, become separated. Like w anytime you bend metal in it, you see that discoloration. Yeah. You know, that that's that's a, a severe weakening. You know, those things don't come back together. Well, and yeah, and what happens, and this is where like, I'm like dancing on the edge of knowing what I'm talking about oh, here. Oh yeah, well that's what we do here. Um, but it's funny the timing of it because I, I listen to some like woodworking podcasts and it's just funny some of the things that can kind of transfer over, um, but uh, I don't know, just, I'll just get into it. Why not? I didn't even put this in my notes, but I just thought of it as we were talking. Um, so I was talking about um, saw, saw teeth and, um, you know, certain types of saws, there's all different kinds of ways you can arrange the teeth, but a lot of saws will have teeth that it's like one bends kind of out one way and one bends out a little yeah, the other way. Yeah, I've seen those. You know, it helps to make chip clearing easier when you're making the cuts, um, you know, but some sometimes you you know they can bend and they can bend back with with use um and it's funny because in this podcast they were talking about you know weakening that metal and then it getting you know kind of more flexible or whatever and then them snapping off yeah because that can happen over time but in their own feedback which is funny because in the woodworking world feedback is a whole other term which also applies in the both the podcast and working woodworking anyway um but they were talking about somebody was like a metallurgist or something and gave them feedback. And they said, actually what happens with most metals when they bend, especially steel, um, I don't know about stainless steel, but maybe it still applies. When you bend it like back and forth, it's not actually getting more flexible. It's getting harder. Um, like when you are strength hardening like metal um, and think about like forging and stuff like that, yeah. you're bending it, you're doing all that. That actually makes it stronger, but more brittle. So what, actually with enough time would happen if you're flexing a steel nib over and over and over and over again, you're actually going to harden the metal because of that flexibility. Now, I don't know that that would happen just with writing pressure. That would be like if you literally bent it and bent it back. It's not that you're making the, the metal more pliable, you're actually making it harder, but more brittle. But it would kind break of before it was able to get hard. Well, it, it's sort of like if you take a paper clip and you bend it yeah. back and forth, you're actually, you're like compressing those molecules and it's making it harder, but more brittle. So eventually it's gonna snap off. So it's not that it gets more wobbly, you're, it actually gets stiffer, but then it snaps. A weakness through strengthening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so again, I'm very much dancing with the realm of things that I don't quite know what I'm talking huh. about, but I, I would anticipate maybe that if you were actually flexing it enough 
to like rearrange some of those molecules in the steel, it would actually make it less flexible over time. And then it would eventually break because you've made it more brittle. Mm. So maybe, maybe I've actually just talked myself out of that. Because I've it, definitely it's not even technically possible for this to happen. Because I've definitely bent nibs plenty, sure. and they've broken. You know, I've had plenty yeah. of oh, broken yeah. nibs break them, right at sure. the steel. So for sure, for sure. Um, that's fascinating. Again, if you work in the metallurgy or like yeah, luckily in the metal we have field, we have viewers that are far smarter. Let than us we know. Are. But as I'm talking about it, I'm like making the connections from kind of what I'm heard, and I'm like, oh, that is interesting. But what I will say though is, it's very possible that maybe it's not more flexible, but maybe maybe just with heavy pressure, the tines have have sprung just a little bit, and it's writing wetter. And you could be anticipating like maybe that is part of it, or maybe just the inks that you used to use back in the day were a little drier, and now the ones you're using are wetter, and you're just remembering it differently. That's certainly possible. Yeah, if it started off and the tines were really close together, like and yeah. like almost touching, and through yeah. use they've opened up a little bit, you might be just it might be easier to see some movement than it, there used to be. Yeah, but I it's you know pretty much the only time I've ever seen flexibility added is when you actually like remove material from the nib, yeah. like alteration like a nib meister is like grinding parts of it away yeah that's the only time you're really going to add any meaningful flexibility to things so you know nibs are made to withstand like a very long time of regular use so i'm i'm really curious as to your experience here but i don't think that this is like chemically physically whatever metallurgically like a likelihood to happen it's there's a fascinating probably, question though probably something else explaining your experience yeah. um but again i'd love feedback on this because again i'm no scientist and i'm questioning yeah, my own this feedback is, on it yeah no no i didn't i didn't put this on here because i thought we would answer no, it's an interesting but, question yeah I thought it's thought provoking exactly it's, it's interesting the timing because literally just like a couple, a couple of days ago i was listening to that podcast there you so, go anyway cool all right that's all we got for q a this week um but we're gonna move on if you have any questions by all means you can ask us in the comments on youtube is a great place um instagram whenever we post there uh asking for questions or you can email us at pencast at gooleypens.com especially if you're an audio listener all right um, let's do a little pen spotlight, shall we? We have the Monteverdi MVP. Here we go. Cool. Got this crazy looking box. MVP by for Monteverde. Monteverde. Yeah. I mean, this is an affordable pen, right? It's like $28 for this thing. Comes in a plastic case. And look at this. There it is. De I see a disposable Honestly, pipette. Honestly, it's decent presentation for what it is. And to have this like cast resin pen not an injection molded at this price point already is kind of impressive. It is pretty. But it's just a cute little thing. It's just a tiny little pocket pen. That is a tiny pen. Um, now, this is not a new pen. This has been out for a little while, but it's new to us. And so we want to just kind of show it because it's kind of so different. Um, but basically, it's uh, this little pen. It's got a number five size nib, which is, you know, on the smaller end, but it's not the smallest thing that we have. It yep. is a uh, cartridge converter pen. So it's got your standard international cartridge. No, sorry, not converter. Cartridge pen. Um, but it's also eyedropper, which is why they give this little pipetter so that you can uh, eyedrop the pen if you are so inclined. So you can just take the cartridge and stick it on the back there, right to your heart's content, or um, it's got a uh, O-ring already installed on yeah, here. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, so you got all kinds of possibilities. You can fill the whole body with ink. There's no joints or anything like that to worry about. So, you know, you can just do straight up O-ring and rely on that or you know if you got some silicon grease throw a little bit on there it won't hurt anything it's like a belt and suspenders kind of a situation mm -hmm. but you get pretty decent ink capacity i can't remember off the top of my head what it is but it's, it's you know going to be substantially more than just a cartridge it's oh, like a mill sure. and a half or two mils or something like that what does it look like when you hold that just by itself in your hand it looks like if i wanted to do a magic <laughs> trick and just be like look kids i can write and be like like, um, but it's pretty ridiculous, oh, especially yeah, in my even, hand. It doesn't even touch. I your, can't even like. Here, let me see if I, mean, I can. Let me see if I can do it. Yeah, I mean, you got pretty decent sized hands too. If you got really small hands, I mean, it might be okay. Yeah, it, my hands are definitely is small. It usable? Just, it's it's at least touching my palm. I, I guess I got longer fingers. Yeah, I mean, it definitely goes in. But if I wanted to really choke up on it, I could. But honestly, most of the time when I'm writing, I kind of hold it. You hold it up back. like that? That I probably do. makes more sense for doing this. Size, I'm, I'm realizing yeah. that I have a really choked up grip. Yeah. I mean, I could write, I could write like that, kind of resting it like that. It's not yeah. unnatural. But my more natural state would be like this, which is un unfunctional. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is meant to be posted. So yeah, it yeah. threads to post. It's designed to be to be uh, done that way. Sorry. Okay. 
got a pretty thin grip section here because it's a small pen, so that makes sense. Um, you know, fine, medium, and broad nib, I think, on this one. Yeah, uh, and, and 1.1 stub, right? And uh, do they do an Omniflex too, right? I would have to confirm that, but perhaps. We've got three different colors. So if you like that uh, kind of multicolor flecked look, kind of a vintage you know, material design. Yeah, a little bit. I think, but they're pleasant. I like this one the most, the one with the, the teal and stuff. Yeah. Um, I did grab a Coeco mini converter because hmm. I haven't tried it on this yet. And I was just curious if it would even fit. I haven't tried it. So I was just curious. We'll do a live test right now. This thing is tiny. Like the capacity on this is even less than those mini converters. Cartridge. You got to yeah. shove it on there. Okay. Okay, so I'm not. I'm gonna pull the plunger all the way back. Yeah, there's no way. If the plunger is all the, all the way back, still, it's after gonna go halfway these, down. Okay, we'll see if that if it pushes uh, the plunger well, down no, at no. all, then we'll then we'll know that it's not really. It pushed it half. Oh it my god! It a little bit. What? A little bit. <gasps> I am shocked. So if you only fill it to about here, but realistically, low, that's like maybe half a cartridge is worth. Like yeah. it's not much ink. So I guess if you're bound and determined to use bottled ink and not use a syringe, you could use a mini converter. Put, put the uh, um, back like next to the grip section just to see how close it is. Wow, that it's is pretty close. so close. It's pretty close. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm it's, impressed. I was possible, not but you know, if you fill it up, you know, if you only fill it up to here, then you can put it on and yeah. use it, I guess. But you got to be pretty determined. That's really surprising. So yeah, there we go. But it is also really tough to get on there. Um, yeah. Those so, are tough to get on Kavecos too, though. Yeah. The number five nibs are okay. I don't, I think the number six nibs write a little better. Um, I tried the 1.1 and it was a little bit toothy. So it's like, it's not the best writing experience, but for me, it's more of like the compact utility of these things. The colors are pretty neat. And uh, it's just like a throw it in your pocket, throw it in your bag kind of a pen. Yeah, $28. For the price with cartridge, you just use cartridges with it. And it's pretty, you don't have to think a lot about it. So do we still sell Goulet number five neat. nibs? Uh, we do, yeah. So you could swap one of these out on there. There you go. But you know, yeah, so it's, it's always a possibility. So yeah. What do you think MVP. is a good, uh, what do you think the MVP stands for, Brian? Wrong answer only. Wrong answer only. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to say most violent porcupine. There we go. Love it. Didn't you do like a survey of, of people who had- I did a couple weeks ago. Feedback about- I did, We got a bunch of really good ones. My two top favorites were um, Montana Vampire Parade. <laughs> and, oh, that's a good one. And then uh, Muffin Viewing Panel. Oh, yeah. Muffin viewing. Panel. It just makes me think of like a bakery window, like, oh. Oh, yes. But a panel, so it's very official. I mean, this is an official group here. Oh, you're thinking like a people panel. I'm thinking, thinking like, like a, a panel, like an organization of people that oh. are designed to view muffins. I was thinking like a glass, like a panel of glass. I like mean, a, it also works. That is oh. a, hom a homonym that can be interpreted a couple of I ways. No, I like, I like a. A collection of panels. I'm thinking like officials with yeah, clipboards like and that. glasses with the chain on yes. it. Yes. That are going around like perhaps judging the muffins. I like that even more. <laughs> I want to be on a muffin viewing panel. Time to view the muffins. A uh... muffin eating panel. Now we're talking. Yes, sir. Anyway. All right. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's the MVP. Do you want to talk about some what's happenings? Oh, I think we need to talk about what's happening. We do. We've covered too many fountain pen things today. We do. We, we've been too serious. We need to uh, tell do, you what. goof it up a little bit. So what's happening? Friday, we had a half day, paid half day. We did. Because Gully Pen Company, hooray for that. We did. Um, I was not able to like really <gasps> mentally rest. Oh, no. Uh, my dog had to get neutered that day. Oh. So Felix, young Felix, turned a year. So it was time. Mm. Um, so we got that done. Um, his recovery has been more eventful than mm. Hank's, which was his father. He was Hank was three when he got fixed and Felix was just one. So his energy level mm. already very different. So we are having yeah. to be very strict with his limitation of movement. So he's staying in the crate. The thing that sucks mm. is that Hank is a very low energy loaf of laziness and cuddleability. It's the best kind. It is. So <laughs> um he was able to kind of be out pretty regularly because he yeah. just didn't move anyway. So yeah. Wasn't um, much of a life change? No, not much. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, he doesn't. He also doesn't care when he's in his crate. So, right. you know. It's easy. But Felix does not like to be in there as much. Aww. He's a very high-energy dog. So, but he has to stay in it more because he is a high-energy dog. He doesn't, so it's, he doesn't, he's not aware enough, doesn't know, know like, yes, why he's in he there. Yes, he jumps. And when he jumps <sighs> off the couch, he doesn't just kind of, like, go from the couch down to the floor. 
he's on the couch, up into the air and down onto the floor. Like he oh. leaps up and down. Like he uh, is a leaper. He's got that youthful energy. I, I, we we thought we've talked about kind of getting him in one of those like dog agility classes, like with the tunnels and the ramps and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. If he was a little bit more obedient, we would do that. But <laughs> the energy is definitely there. Like he can jump into the back yeah. of the CRV. Like wow. that's a and he's a little dog with tiny yeah. legs. He woo, goes right up. Wow. Anyway, so I'm dealing with that, dealt with that on Friday. And then my wife, after kind of tossing around, maybe we'll go, maybe we won't go to this party on Friday, mm. changed her mind and said, Let, actually, no, I think we are going to go because we were going to have Archer get watched by a babysitter, but that fell through. So we were like, ah, maybe we shouldn't go. But then... Um, Was there ever a time where you wanted to go to a party and she wanted to stay No. In? Has that ever happened? Never. <laughs> that has not yet happened. Um, the enough. kicker, though, that this was a themed party again. Hey, I so, love those themed parties. This is a different person throwing this party. Man, that's like, I'm sure it's fun as heck, but that feels like work to me. It is because I'm the type of person, I don't want to go to a party themed like and just kind of phone it in. I'm like, if we're going, we got to dress up yeah. or not go at all. So I told her we were at Bygones, which is a vintage clothing store um, in Richmond last week to look for potential outfits because it mm-hmm. is a Titanic themed birthday party. Oh, that's a fun like um, dress so everybody, scenario there. Everybody either dr- needs to dress first class, second class, or third class or whatever their names for them. I don't remember. Uh-huh. Um, and we were there and we were looking and Shannon was like, ah, this is busy. I don't like it. No, we don't need to go. We don't have a babysitter anyway, whatever. And then there he said, oh no, just bring Archer. He can go upstairs and just kind of play Switch in one of the bedrooms. And she said, okay, Drew, we are going to go. I was like, I was just, we were just there. And you said we weren't going to go. So I was going to get the shirt and I didn't get the shirts. So So I have a vintage suit from like the 60s. It's definitely not Titanic theme, but it's, you know, old enough. It doesn't look modern. So I wanted to go back to bygones and get another kind of vintage shirt with like a white collar, white cuffs and Mm. So I did that on Friday. So were, you, I, were you a first class in this scenario? I, then? I was closer to first class. Mm. Um, they were, Look at you. There were plenty of people there wearing top and tails, though. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. Maybe you're like second class. We're talking then. about <laughs> everybody dressed up. It was like, wow. Man, it was something. So, man, you got better friends than I do. My friends, <laughs> they, they are. I'm lucky to like even see them. They, they <laughs> Everybody's are. Everybody's got so much going on. They are something else. They really are. <laughs> um, and then I got Shannon some, uh, you know, like arm length the satin gloves to dress up a dress that she already had nice so we did that um it was something it was How you many know people are at this party oh probably like 40 like it was a lot wow it was, maybe it wasn't 40 more than 20 wow um that's a crowd it was a crowd yeah wow. and almost everybody was dressed up too it was how about that it was definitely something so we did that on friday um okay uh, and then, um, let's see, Saturday, Archer and I watched the Mandalorian episode, which we do every Saturday. This, this week's the last one though. It's the, uh, season, oh. season, um, uh, finale. Okay. So we'll see, but uh, we've been enjoying that. And then Shannon just out of nowhere wanted to go to a, um, hibachi restaurant for lunch. So hmm. we went over to Kabuto on, uh, West yeah. Broad, you know, it's been there since we remember. That's a lot for lunch though. Uh, they have a lunch special, but yeah, physically, the amount of food is the a lot of rice that you consume. Yeah. One of like us ate Hibachi everything restaurant. on his plate. The other two took stuff home. I probably shouldn't have <laughs> eaten everything, but Didn't I did. just talk about this? Your lunch, I know. Uh, I know. Lunch I know. I had a light dinner though. Okay. Um, but, uh, so we did that. That was fun. Um, that is fun. That always, was an experience. Yeah. Um, and then we went home and Archer, uh, wanted to dye eggs this uh, the year Easter has already passed, so that's whatever. But uh, we were able to get an Easter egg dye kit for cheap. It was buy one get one free or something. Okay. So did that? Did you get the Paws brand? Egg of course, dye kits? of course. It's number one retailer. It's the only one around. Egg dyeing kits. They've they've got the they've got the lock on that industry. That's right. I, dyes outperform everyone else in the industry. And he got so excited. It's a thirty dollar reference, by the way. Eat the eggs, and we cracked them open, and they were not cooked all the way. Oh no! They were they, <laughs> they were they were not runny, but they were uh, wet. Oh, and like wet, wet eggs, are shiny. Something you are not into. <laughs> like I was so sad, and he was really oh. disappointed too. And I I followed an instruction online. Like I don't know how you can screw up. Like I. Yeah, all right, that's stupid <laughs> eggs. We threw them all away, but oh, we're no. done. Oh, he man. he kept a good attitude though. We have a we have a um, we give him a point if he either does something really polite or really kind or does a chore. 
And I gave him a point for that because it's something he was very much looking forward to. Mm. We did, we spent the whole afternoon dyeing eggs and then cooling the eggs and, you know, letting them rest and painting them. And finally, and he didn't get upset. He was, he was cool. He's like, well, can I get a picture? I was like, yeah, hold up an egg, smile, got a picture. And he was remarkably cool about it. You know, he Good handled his emotions well. Good on him. Yeah. Like he could have definitely lost it. Um, this is maturing. I hope so. And we took him to the park and let him ride his bike. Uh, so that was enjoyable. Fun, fun. And then um, because of Eddie's party on Friday, Shannon did not get to watch her series, season finale of RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh -huh. So I suggested we just buy the one episode on Amazon and watch that. So I watched mm. the, I've never seen the show before, but I watched the finale with her. You right into the finale. Yeah, well, right. I mean, I'd, she'd been giving me updates. So, so I like kind of knew, I, who, I knew who I was supposed to root for. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so we did that. I think she was very happy that um, that's, I, I, that's I shared that with her. That's fun. But yeah, and I was like, I was super sad. I'm like, oh, honey, like you're gonna miss your thing. You've been watching this for weeks. She's like, yeah, I know. But of course, all her friends that watched it with her are there at the party, and mm. that would not fit Messed the up Titanic. Not getting spoilers too. Like, yeah, that's well, I, part of she said thing. she thought she got a spoiler, and uh -huh. it turned out she did. So oh, that's nice. yeah, that's, that's nice. nice. Hmm. Um, and then Sunday we did um, take Archer to see the Mario movie. Um, Fun. He was really excited about that. Mostly, I think from FOMO from his like friends at school mm -hmm. um but we watched that and it was pretty solid i don't think it was as good as sonic but sonic, um, sonic that's a high bar sonic i think sonic is the best video game movie ever made mm -hmm. um but uh mario kind of felt like you know uh, a series of cut scenes from a very good mario game so yeah. but it, it did what it was supposed to do mm -hmm. um but uh it was a fun watch it was a fun watch i think like yeah. for for me like it was nice i remember seeing the live action Mario movie and getting really excited that like, I'm just going to see a Mario movie. Oh my God. And man, it was terrible. So it, I just, <laughs> it for, for me, I kind of put on that hat, like my kid hat to say like, Drew, you're finally, after all these years, going to walk into a theater and see, see a, Mario a Super movie. Mario Brothers movie. A like movie there was movie. a time where that would have just melted my little brain. Yeah. So I put on my, you know, eight year old optimistic hat, yeah. watched it through that lens and it was enjoyable. That's fun. Yeah. Um, but you know, with like any kid theme movie like that, you're like, all right, this might be. Yeah, no, you it, know, was, it just, was solid. There was so yeah, many you references. Adjust your expectations. So many references. Like Mario's cell phone theme was the opening title to the GameCube like boot up screen. Oh, nice. Like little things okay. like that that like. Little Easter eggs. Oh, it was yeah. like every scene. Well, they got like 30 years of oh, like yeah. stuff to pull from. Every you know? scene had an Easter egg, pretty wow. much. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, one of the best things about the movie theater, though, Brian. Mm. I did not see any Dots candy. Really? I have always complained that I hate Dots because of how popular they are and how I can <laughs> see them so many places. And why are they at gas stations? Why are at the, why is a box of them at the movie theater? They're mm. not in the movie theater anymore. Not at Regal Cinemas anyway. Huh? And Do that they have made like me... any alternative, like Juju Bees or like any I mean, other? No, they they had candy like it. Uh, or... Sour Patch Kids, I think you know. That's not but the same. I don't know. All I knew is that they weren't there. And it made me just really happy. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe the world created, is finally... created a groundswell over the This is the, the years, one Drew. part of the world that's actually getting more sane. Wow. Everything How else is going that? downhill. How but um, Or maybe they're so popular that they're just out nah. of stock. Everybody's, you've been so talking I, about them so much. I, I think that I will... Uh, nabbed I, them all up. I can dial back my um, um, uh, vit vitriol. I don't know. Um, yeah, vitriol. Yeah, that's appropriate. Dial back the vitriol. <laughs> Uh, and then later that day, I helped Shannon run lines for her show, which oh. was the first time I, you know, did that with her. And um, okay, how was uh, that process? She, it was good. She had she knew way more of it than she thought she did. That's always helpful. she was like, I, I really need help. I'm like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. And she really only needed me to feed her like three lines. It wasn't bad at all. And she was like, Oh my god, I guess I do know this. I'm like, yeah, you do. It's awesome. Yeah. So she's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty ship shape, tip top there. Nice. They still the uh, show has not even come close to finishing like the plant uh from little shop of horrors like oh it's like not even close to being done wow it's like kind of kind of a kind yeah of a key feature in the play yeah like it's a hmm. little nerve-wracking okay but there's nothing she can do about that it's just like yeah, that's not really her role in no that, but, but uh, uh, that that's the thing though it's like it's got to look good that plan has got to look good or else it's just gonna look like a high school play hmm. anyway We'll see how it goes, but uh, yeah, that was that was pretty much my weekend. It was 
solid, enjoyable. Nice, fun. Yeah. Do you fun. remember? Do you remember the live action Super Mario Brothers like cartoon show from the eighties? Oh yeah. Oh, we've rewatched some of that with my kids. Do you remember the family. song? You know, we're the Mario Brothers and Plumbers. Oh yes. Like well, that, I heard that. That made a small appearance. Get out like, of here. The, the song. Yeah. Wow. That made me very very happy. That's a deep cut right yeah. there. Yeah. Wow. So there were there was there were some solid moments like that. Okay. We'll probably enjoy Rachel and I will probably enjoy that a lot because we've played yeah quite and, a bit and, of Mario and, and seriously years. Peach was like the champ of that whole movie like good Mario was consistently like getting hurt and failing and falling and Peach there was not one yeah. time where Peach was in danger like ever good, good. like. Honestly, Mario was kind of inconsequential. Like, <laughs> Peach could have done it all herself, probably. Wow, okay. Yeah. Fair enough, man. Cool. What about um, you? Yeah, so I had my, well, mental health half day. I didn't actually leave the office until 3 o'clock, so I had like a half-half day. Yeah. But, you, you know, a lot it was going a crazy on. week, and I just needed to catch up on some stuff. Yeah. But it's all good. It helped my mental health to wrap up a few things. And then I went home, worked on RC car a little bit there with we Joseph. Go. Some of the parts that I had ordered came in. So we replaced the wheel hubs and I replaced the drive shafts. Or the all of these shafts. Up, like optional upgrades or repairs? Um, sort of both. So I had sort of broken a piece on the drive shaft. It was like a screw had popped out and another piece had bent a little bit. And so I was you like, repaired it with an upgrade? Yeah. There yeah. We it's like, well, do I want to keep replacing this part knowing that after like two days of running it, yeah. I'd already broken it, but it was pre-owned too. So it's like, I don't know how much it was. It might've been before, on its way out. Yeah. But it was also kind of fun. Like there's some parts and replace it. Yeah, we go. Cool. It was kind of cool. Cause like Joseph was like, kind of like at first he was like, oh, I don't really want to get and take this whole thing apart. <laughs> But as I was showing him, he was like surprisingly adept at like, you know, doing that, different That's things. kind of his MO, isn't it? Like, Yeah, he like picks up on stuff pretty quick. Yeah, know. but he's usually kind of like hesitant to get like super involved in something. But then when he yeah. does, he's when like. When he does, he picks up on it pretty Yeah. Quick. Yeah. So that was fun. It was difficult because I wanted to just dive in and just do it. But, you know, it was him and his sister wanted to play with him and he had to shout, you know. So I had to like navigate the time that I spent with him around things like that Friday night into Saturday morning. But I mean, we we like um, the body of the RC car is like this kind of flimsy plastic and we've like banged it up pretty good already. Yeah. Not to like the point of like needing to be replaced and they are replaceable, but they're kind of expensive. So I saw some YouTube videos of like using, you know, that like weave kind of tape like you would use for either like drywall or cement board or something like that, mesh tape. So like some of that and then using like a, you know, like a flexible adhesive and you kind of like spread it on there and just kind of like you're like reinforcing it. So, you know, we took it all apart and took the body off and, and did that adhesive thing. And he was a good sport with me, he, you know, had gloves on and was spreading the adhesive. And so it was cool to like, get to do some just like nerdy RC car stuff with my son. That so was cool. That was pretty cool. And now it's like the car's more robust and we can just drive it around and flip it and nice. crash into stuff and not really have to worry about it as much. So nice. You still sticking with fun. that one ramp you built? Yeah. Yeah. The ramp, you know, uh, I don't think the ramp's going to hold up that well over time. Mm. It was kind of a proof of concept, but now I'm like, oh, there's some parts that are, I could see breaking down over time because <laughs> I didn't build it the best. I would redesign it now, but it wasn't bad for like kind of throwing it together. Well, there you go. Or Replace we, it with an upgrade. Pulled it on, jumped it a few more times, and had a good time. But yeah, we're just having fun. With Have it. you taken it on the trail yet? Uh, a little bit, yeah. a little bit here. And nice. There. Yeah, you can only take it so far though, because you know if you drive too far, you can't really see it anymore. Oh, so it's right. more fun to have like kind of in a field with some. Oh like, yeah, I guess because you, you'd have to follow yeah. it. Yeah, you have to follow it. Yeah. I mean, it's not that it wouldn't run, but you just wouldn't see what the heck is going yeah. on. Yeah. And then you just smash it into a tree, and you're like, okay, well, yeah. that's pointless. Um, but it's still fun. Um, and then, um, we're watching Ted Lasso, which I know you're watching as well. Uh, yeah, haven't, the, haven't started the new season yet. It's good. We're it's waiting, good. we're waiting we're for the whole, I think we're waiting for the whole thing to come out. Oh, okay. We're doing it like one week at a time. Old yeah. School, we do, know? we do some shows like that, but very few. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. This one's good. It's good. Nice. You'll like it. Um, I'm not a sports person at all, but you know, the character, it's a really well done show. I'm not like super fanboy of it, you know. I'm like, but I saw a clip um, of uh, the guy who plays Roy Kent on Sesame Street growling at Oscar. That's great. Like they were both growling at each other. That's great. It was pretty marvelous. He's like a total laughable, lovable goofball in yeah. real life. Like it's not a character at all. But he also kind of does channel that vibe a little bit in real life. Oh, yeah, too. He, can, he can do it. He so can do it. he can get there. Yeah. Yeah. He won like some kind of, I don't remember what award it was. Maybe it was one of the Emmys or something like that. And he was like his smiley like self. 
And then he like went into the <laughs> part of it and you're like, oh, I see the like. I, lo I love it when mm -hmm. actors can do that. Cause like so there are a lot of actors that don't like to do impressions of a character they're famous for playing. But, and I know that that must get annoying and old because everybody asks sure. you to do it. Yeah. But there is something really lovable and familiar about an actor who is totally fine doing it, knowing that like, hey, this is what brought me to the dance. Yeah. Why not? Like, well, he's a writer on the show. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And he like. So that's his creation almost. Yeah. Oh, and that's he, cool. Like he created that character. I think. I think I, I. We were just talking about this at lunch today. Um. And then like yeah, he was a right. He was a writer for the show, and then like basically had to audition for that character because people that knew him were like, you can't be this guy. Oh wow. They're like, you're like the most lovable guy in the world. How could you be this guy? But then he like. That's amazing. Really got into character. So it's like that's pretty fun. Because like Johnny Depp does it too. Like he has no problem jumping into Jack Sparrow at any time. Right. And I just think that's, that's pretty fun. cool. I like it when actors like really own their characters. Uh, Giancarlo Esposito, who from breaking bad um, yeah um yeah they uh, yeah. uh um he yeah. he, oh. he um gus, gus, frank. Gus. gus frank yeah yeah he loves jumping into his characters oh yeah like he's such a oh, relatable stuff, yeah. chill dude like he goes to comic cons like yeah loves so star cool. wars crap like he's just a really, really cool and he has no problem this all of a sudden he's laughing he just will get serious and say you know bring me the child or something like that and i just there's something very real about that, that that's I enjoy. really fun that's really fun um, yeah, so that's kind of cool. Um, kid, both kids had sleepovers that oh, kind of really? like happened. Yeah, like one we had at our house, another one um, happened to the other house. And we're just like in that phase now where I'm like, I really feel like Rachel and I are just like project managers yeah. and chauffeurs like for our kids. Oh, man. Like, it's just, it's, it's, it kind of creeps up on you because like at first you're like, oh, yeah, they're kids. Da, da, da. And what? I'm like, no, they're like taller than Rachel now. And they're just like needing to be driven around places. So and, let me ask you a question about sleepovers. Do you... Okay connect with the parents before your kid goes and stays a night over there. Yeah, we always try to. So, so what do you, what do you, how do you manage that? Do you be like, hey, let's meet you. Let, I need to meet you so I know you're not a creepy weirdo. Like, what do you? Oh, uh, well, we more like connect like through text or like talking to them or something like that. We okay. haven't necessarily like met the parents in person. Yeah, yet but like you've, thing. you've engaged with them enough to know that they're not totally Yeah, we try to mobiles. suss out. Yeah, and likewise, they want to know that we're not weirdos either. Okay. You know what I mean? So there's I just, like, like a I, I just don't know how do you, how do you approach that and not, seem awkward it is a little bit awkward but it's awkward for everybody involved, okay. you know because yeah. it's like my kids now they're like they go to school i'm not at school with them especially in middle school it's yeah like they they go there and he has friends that he meets and he talks about them yeah. and you're just like who which one is which i guess one is it's, it? i guess know? it's different when you get into middle school but like right now when yeah. he's in elementary school it's like you know i've seen most parents at like birthday parties and stuff like that yeah. but, but not all of them yeah as you as you get you know ellie's in fifth grade now so she's going to be in middle school next year but you know it's at the point like and that's part of why i went on a field trip yeah. you know and was chaperoned that's so i could call. just like you know hear these kids that she's talking about all the time i can like put a face to it now mm -hmm. at least but it's you know i can i can feel it happening just the kids yeah. are like i know less about their everyday life than i used to when they were little and oh. around all the time so yeah you just gotta try to talk to them more and connect where you can and you know they will slowly resent that and then want nothing to do with me. And oh. then I'll be a dork and they will, I'll have to force them to go on family vacations to see them at all. And you know, it's the way of the world, right? Yeah, like it's how it, it goes. Is. I guess that, that, that and clarity then, and expectations is yeah. step one. It's, you know, it's happening. I can see it unfolding, but I mean, we have great relations with our kids yeah. and that's more just like, you know, that's why I'm like doing the RC car thing as a, you know, desperate attempt to just have another thing to connect and have my kids want to do something, you know, with me. But um, anyway, so I can just see like the next three to four years is just going to be a lot of this, a lot of coordinating and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's, it's all still fun. Um, also did some yard work. It's just, I don't know what happened all of a sudden. It's spring now and it's, I'm like, I put all my coats away in my closet and it's not cold enough anymore for me to ever need a coat. Monday this week is technically our last frost date oh. in our region. So Okay. Unless Histori something crazy Historically happens. Historically speaking, yeah, we should be done. Okay. Well, good to know. Well, the plants got the memo because it's full on pollen everywhere. Yes, and it is. Like I'm literally like clearing pollen off my driveway. Like I can almost like scoop it up like snow it's like so yeah. thick <laughs> like if you, if you and it's our ridiculous. deck is like slippery yeah with pollen yeah i have to like blow it off with a leaf blower so that i don't yeah. like slip in the driveway and stuff it's crazy um so lots of that lots of weed pulling and just boring stuff i'm moving logs and mulching stuff it's i don't even i didn't even take any pictures of it because i'm like this is 
nothing entertaining, but I'm doing a lot of that. I do it for exercise, fitness. Um, and then I'm just, as I'm working and stuff, I'm catching up on some podcasts. I just like got out of, you know, out of habit with some of the podcasts. So I was like catching up on some woodworking ones. Um, there is a woodworking podcast called Wood Talk. It's been on since 2007. Oh, wow. You want to talk OG podcasting. They were podcasting before podcasting was like even a thing. Uh, but anyway, the, the guy, Mark Spagnola, who's on there, sounds almost exactly like Brian Gray from Edison Pens. Oh, wow. So it's so funny. I just have this like weird connection to this guy because he sounds so much That's like Brian funny. Gray. And I've talked to Brian Gray a ton. So anyway, he kind of looks like him too a little bit. Um, anyway, um, but also big fan of the Office Ladies podcast as well. Amazing. But I'm like, t I'm like, tw I don't know what happened. I'm like 20 episodes behind and yeah. I just, just fell off my radar. So now I'm catching up a little bit, enjoying that. We watched, we listened to Office Ladies all the way down to South Carolina and all the way back. Great. Just constantly, it's so good. Those it's two good. are so lovable. They are, and that and that that podcast is like one of the ten top ten in the world. It's amazing for downloads. Good for them. Like they're right up there with them. all the murder podcasts and the Joe Rogan <laughs> show and Why Won't You Date Me? Like boom, wow. Office Ladies. Like it's awesome. They are champs. They figured it out. And it's just so like it's so lighthearted. They deserve it. Yeah. Like I just you know there's so much crap going on in the world just to have you know and it's like I I get now like why people like what we try to do in the pen cast. It's an escape. Staying positive yeah, and escape yeah. and all that. You need that. It's nice for us to have that too. And that's one of my, it is. One of my Shannon will listen, to, will watch The Office as like a decompression every night before bed. And she listens to Office Ladies for that same purpose. It's, yeah. it's her, the Office Ladies podcast provides her with that same sure. sort of, you know, mental respite that the show does for her. It's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty, pretty awesome. cool. Yeah. Poor Jenna Fisher recently like broke her arm or something. Oh really? I didn't yeah. hear about that. I think she skis a lot. Oh. But well, yeah, there there, there will be a little bit of a break, I think. Oh, interesting. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I haven't gotten to that part yet, but I'm still like in the holiday season, so I'm still a little bit behind. Why well, we watched the one with um, they finally got Steve Carell on there. Yeah, which was awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, so cool. And then I'm also listening to Darknet Diaries. Oh boy, which is like the why? Opposite, it's like the opposite of lighthearted. Oh my god, it's like every like cyber IT nightmare you can imagine. Oh. But it's pretty fascinating. You know, I'm not like freaking out about things but it's it's educational for me i'm like oh didn't know that that was a thing that i should maybe be thinking about you know all, all the ways but, uh, good something to know. can be ruined that's right penetration testing and it security stuff and there's some pretty there's some not as like freaky kind of stuff on there too but it's very educational but anyway very it's very well done well done show though anyway so yeah that's kind of what i'm up to nice yeah we got a couple of company updates and we'll wrap this sucker up um, one thing I was mentioned here, um, thankfully this won't disrupt our pen cast schedule at all, but I'm actually leaving tomorrow. <gasps> I'm going to Indianapolis. Oh, Indiana, Indiana. Police. Never been to Indianapolis. Um, but I'm going to a, uh, I call it a work conference. It's a uh, EOS, which is entrepreneurial operating system. If you've ever heard of the book traction by Gino Wickman, I it's think I a have system that is in that. So it's basically about like meeting structure, organizational communication, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a quick trip. I will be gone and back by the time this video publishes. So uh, I won't really have time to see anything in Indianapolis. Can't do any meetups or anything, but I'll be going there and coming back. So maybe I'll talk about it next week if I learn something cool. Um, and then Drew, you got a couple of videos that are worth talking about. I need to do a what's new this week because I've been Yes. Not doing that for like the past three weeks. And there's a lot to uh, cover now. There is. There is. I'm not going to go all three weeks back, but yeah, I'll definitely okay. cover what's, what's we'll new this the best, week. Best ofs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. So you'll do that. And then you got another one, the uh, best ink in every brand. Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah. Um, best selling, at least. Best selling ink. This one, this one yeah. is an objective Less opinionated. List. Yeah. But still fun. Yeah. Got lots of Drew flavor sprinkled all over it. Yeah. So it should be a fun one. So check those out if you haven't seen them already. All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for watching. Please give us some feedback about how we're doing. Ask us some questions because we want to keep this thing going as long as we humanly can. Um, check out goodlaypens.com for fountain pen, ink, paper, all those needs. And subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all these places that we are, as long as it's legal. And I have a random fun fact. <laughs> um, so I have actually another fun fact that Rachel told me about. And I was like, oh, I'll have to save that because mine is date dependent. Oh, 
Okay. So yeah, I was like, you know, sometimes I got to dig a little deep on these things. Sometimes they just come to me and I have a list. Other times I'm just not feeling it and mm -hmm. I got to find it. So this is one of those I got to dig. Okay. So What'd I was just like, well, I was like, let me see. This video is publishing on April 21st. Let me look up some interesting things that have happened on April 21st All right. of the world. And the first website I found was some histor found with some historical thing, which was like Tiananmen Square and like oh God. all these like oh God. massacres and horrible things of the world. And I was like, ah. well, this sucks. Let me find something more lighthearted. Mm -mm. Um, well, I know you like Elvis Presley with his TCB. I, 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 I've, you so know. I found an Elvis Presley thing I from April 21st. Someone on Pulp Fiction once said you're either an Elvis man or a Beatles man. And I'm definitely not a Beatles man, so I guess I'm an Elvis Are man. Are they that? I don't feel like you they're like opposed to each other. Why can't you like both? I don't know. This is what I heard. Oh, okay. So I, well, I, I can't say I'm like a huge Elvis fan, but I'm definitely not a Beatles fan. So if that puts me in the Elvis camp, then TCB, baby. Okay. Well, on April 21st. Peanut butter and banana, man. <laughs> on April 21st in 1956, Elvis Presley's first hit record, Heartbreak Hotel, became number one. Well, how about that? So kind of a historical moment. All right. And then I have another fact, but then I have a sub fact. Oh. More of a... Tri like, a trivia, like a sandwich. Trivia question. Yeah. Like so it's like a fun sandwich. fact trivia sandwich. No, no, like sub. Sub. <laughs> yes. Sandwich. Indeed. Yes. I didn't didn't pick up on that when you said Equals it. No subs. All right, Drew. So Elvis is the number two artist with the most cumulative weeks in the number one spot on the Billboard Top 100. So if you add up all of his weeks that he had a, top, a number one. Okay. He had 79 weeks of him being number one. Okay. So on someone the else was, top 100. So someone he, else he's was, a number two historically. So, so somewhere, someone else was someone on number else, one longer than Elvis. Yeah. Who is the only artist to beat him in number one? This, they were at 91 weeks in the number one spot. Beatles? No. Beatles was 56 weeks. They're like number five or six. Really? Yeah. I don't know if you'll guess number one. It'll probably surprise you. I was a little bit surprised, but then I thought about it and I was like, oh, I guess. I'm just trying to think of like really, really massively popular bands. Oh, Lou Bega from uh, Mambo Number no. Five. You think Lou Bega has more in the number no, one spot? I, I don't. Than I tell this <laughs> not at all. No. I was just trying to think of a random one hit wonder. Is Mariah Carey? Oh, whoa! She's had a lot of hits. Oh, so these are for different songs. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, just okay. number one spot the oh, most. Oh, okay. Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey. Bigger 90, than Elvis and the Beatles. 91, bigger than everybody. Wow. So it was Mariah Carey, Elvis Presley, Rihanna, the Beatles. Rihanna? Yeah. She's got a lot even, of hits. I can't even name one song of The hers. Beatles, Drake, Boys to Men, Usher, Beyonce, Michael Jackson, and then Adele, Elton John, and Bruno Mars. Michael Jackson's outside. farther down than I thought. I know, right? Isn't that crazy? Also, I can't name a Drake song. You'd probably recognize a bunch of Oh, probably. Of and I'm sure I'd recognize plenty of Mariah Carey songs, too. I just, I just don't recognize any songs that have happened in the last, like, 20 years. Yeah, that I don't too. listen to music. But that's anyway, true. so that was my sub. That was my sandwich about that? trivia fact. Mariah Carey. But I thought this was, a, I, I was, like, also, like, let me see what happened th this day in 1984. Oh, because okay. Because I still had a little 1984 in my veins from last week. April 21st. April 21st, 1984. All right. So after 37 weeks that Michael Jackson's album Thriller was in number one. It got knocked off as top album <gasps> by the soundtrack to Footloose. Oh, yeah. What a swing, huh? Yeah. To go from like this epic album. I mean, not that Footloose is bad. Yeah. But it's like, and it's no thriller. Like, it's a very different vibe. Yeah. But I mean, 37 weeks, that's a, that's a pretty good run. That's a pretty good run. That's a pretty good run. It's anyway. so weird. Like, Kenny Loggins with Footloose and Top Gun are songs that he did not write but like are his two claim to fames and it, they don't sound anything like the rest of his stuff. Isn't that crazy? Not at all. Do you think that bugs him? I don't know. They're like he's spent all this time writing all this stuff. Probably. And it's, then like he didn't even write, the, you know. It should. He crazy. was like, he was like the fourth or fifth choice for Danger Zone. Wow. Yeah. I think you told me about this before. Yeah, he was not, he was yeah. not right up there. Well, you can laugh all the way to the bank. Now. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I would take that. And you asked me to sing Danger Zone. I'd be like, I don't care. Loose is an amazing song too. It's, it's catchy. Yeah. But anyway. Fun facts there for you. So, a little turkey hammock facts. Love um, it. Great. Well, there you go. Let me know if you think I should buy more Drew shirts. <laughs> I don't know if I can take myself seriously. Walk around I do. I have Drew, so much more respect for you now. I'm going to walk around the office a little bit after this <laughs> and see what people think. But, uh, anyway, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week. And bye.